What's going on, Belfour? Gwen the Recovering Witch here, also known as Jen. Welcome to my channel and welcome to this video. Again, I am not recovering from being a witch, but a witch recovering from alcoholism or anything else in my life that I feel that I need to recover from. You can tell I'm looking very different today. Um, sorry, the ring light is on my glasses, so I got some bifocals. Um, I am not sponsored, but I will say this. These were from iBuyDirect. I don't think I paid more than $30 for them. Um, and they are plastic frames. And I think I have like the blue light filter on them. Uh, I can't remember what this was called, but uh, I like them. They're plastic and I've been wanting to get some, some of those big librarian glasses for the longest time. So yeah, but I'm willing to spot, I'm willing to be sponsored iBuyDirect and you know have a longer like what's up video you know like hey check it out and then I gave the wig a rest today I found a YouTube video I was trying to be very lazy about it but it was kind of like this really cool thing with like a mohawk and it was like all of these like little braids like on both sides with like the curls going up like this and I think my hair is too thin for that so I have little rat tails back here but that's okay I still feel like maybe it is kind of a slight mohawk but Oh well. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> Welcome to step eight. And this is step eight out of the 12 step program. And we are covering it out of the Pagan and Recovery book by Deirdre Ann Hebert. And I'm going through all 12 steps. If you are new to the channel, I recommend you go back to the others if you like to learn more about the steps. And um, I'm just speaking from my own experience from being in the rooms of recovery and reading this book and how it ties in with the original big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. If you are interested in learning about the steps, I welcome you to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell for upcoming videos as when they're uploaded. And again, this is for insight if you feel like maybe if you are suffering from some type of behavior or addiction or maybe you're just trying to get some sort of insight as far as spiritual aspect and really getting some sort of other enlightenment from the 12 steps. With that being said, let's dive in. Okay y'all, so we're about to hit the nitty gritty, okay? And we are getting down to more of some of the serious work and this is where it's kind of a lot of people get in fear and then they just want to like fall off, okay? Step four was pretty rolling and then when you kind of get into this, it's just like, oof. But it's okay, we're going to make it together, right? Okay. It can be a little tough and so step eight in the PIR and AA Big Book is I made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. This is a step that we recognize what we have done to others. And we're finding common ground and empathy towards a particular person um, or certain people. And we're willing to make our wrongs become right. My first sponsor would always say it's about me keeping my side of the street clean. So if I've noticed that I have affected somebody in some sort of way, kind of like a neighbor, and my trash has spilled over into my neighbor's trash, I need to go over and go pick it up, you know, and make it right. When we look at the PIR book in Alcoholics Anonymous, we have may we may have worked the steps a little bit differently, depending on what book we have used. I was asked the question if I have done shadow work and Yes, in other videos uh, that I have covered, I thoroughly and truly and honestly believe that the four-step inventory out of Alcoholics Anonymous and the questions that are listed and asked in the 12 Steps and 12 Traditions in Step 4, that is my shadow work. Um, I like doing it that way and asking these questions and what I can do is dive deeper as far as when I am feeling a certain way about a certain thing, why that could be. I keep asking the question why of where am I stem from and so on and so forth. So that is my shadow work for me when I do a four step inventory. There is no right or wrong way of doing shadow work. 
there's many methods and many ways and many tools on doing shadow work. People use divination to do their shadow work for further insight of something that might not be hidden. Um, I mean, there's many, many articles as far as what questions you can be asking yourself and how to do it or even make it into some sort of ritual practice for yourself. So to give a brief explanation about the fourth step when I did it the first time and I've done it multiple times, um, my sponsor did tell me to get the, sorry, this is bothering me. I'm so sorry. Is that better? Okay. You're just going to have to deal with like the glazing over <laughs> the ring light. Well, I guess I could turn it off. Okay. Oh, I guess it's from me. You're seeing the reflection of my glasses into the thing. I'll wear my contacts next time, I swear. I buy direct though. I'm still working with y'all if you want to. So anyway, my sponsor told me basically get a notebook. I am dedicating this notebook as my four step inventory. Each page I am dedicating to a particular person. Any person that I am mad at, institutions, places, any beliefs, ideas, whatever, that really just grind my gears, okay? And I will start to list on that particular person, et cetera, et cetera, why I am angry, why I'm feeling a certain way. And in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, there are some words that basically it's, they're not just words, it's basically putting the specific why I'm angry into a certain category of what it affected my, it could be self-esteem, ego, fear-driven, um, anything dealing with my finances or my bank account, that's how it affected me, you know? So that is what I would look at each single line item and putting that off to the side and seeing what it affected. Then here comes the other thing. Again, trying to be responsible and doing my part. I am going to write out what is my part? What did I do? What did I not do? And what I have come to figure out and kind of put the pieces together is that when I have listed out the things that I should have done, this is also the behaviors and certain actions that I can do moving forward. Because remember, it's not that we are petitioning or praying for these defects, but really the traits that we have we're, they're not going to be prayed away, right? So we acknowledge that we have to put in some work. And when we do that, we're taking the responsibility. And now there is an action. So I can put forward that the action of whatever instance of what something was, what I could have done instead, I will do that going forward. And these situations, they will keep coming up all the time. The difference is, is that it might not be the same people. It is still the same trait or certain behavior or character defect or certain situation that just keeps coming up again and again. It's just wearing a different mask. And it's just to kind of let you guys know that my four step inventory is my shadow work and that is me confronting my shadow when I'm starting to come up with some sort of memory of who I'm mad at or what type of thing that happened. and really working with my shadow and getting to know it. So Hebert says, anyone who has suffered from some sort of addiction has likely fallen short of the nine noble virtues of courage, truth, honor, fidelity, discipline, hospitality, industriousness, self-reliance, and perseverance. She goes on to say that pagans claim we have reverence for nature, but have I harmed nature in some sort of way? I can say yes. I could be better with recycling. Um, again, I need to carry more of my reusable bags when I go to the grocery store to not have more plastic bags to pile. But when my husband and I think about it, we do have a big thing of plastic bags. When we are ready, we go and put them back for the recycle bins that some of our local stores carry. And there's many ways on how you can be environmentally conscious. It's just really researching, knowing, and being respectful. Have I harmed myself in some way? I'm going to touch that probably later on 
in this video. Not probably. I will touch it later on in this video. Uh, and have I enabled others? Because, again, it doesn't have to be we have been a suffering addiction from alcohol or drugs. It could be people. I am a codependent. Hello. There is a lot to think about on this list and on where I may have caused the damage somehow. So that's why I said it was so important for me on my four step on where what I could have done, okay, and being really honest about it. What do we do is the important question. So we are faced with the difficult task of taking ownership and responsibility for the damage we have caused. What is important and so crucial is we need to become willing to prepare ourselves for the next plan and the next step. What I liked in both the big book and in PIR is that these steps they don't put us in a state of harm's way. They are always there to prepare us. And I know from personal experience, there have been times where I just wanted to be so enthusiastic and wanting to get to the other side of things and just get it done and over with. And that's not how it works. There are no shortcuts to these steps, especially when you're working on the first time. You will notice over time as that you have more time in the rooms and in the program is that you're kind of working these steps in different orders and uh 10 11 12 i mean those are the ones that you consistently work every single day but sometimes you may have to go back to the very beginning steps and really just hone in on those they do prep us for before we start making moves and start making waves uh, into action and like I said it's good to be eager but really we need to slow down on the enthusiasm because patience is very much key throughout these steps patience with other people patience with ourselves most importantly and that is how I learned. That is very much how I learned. If I rushed into things, they didn't, which is another important point, if they didn't play out the way that it did, what I had in my head, instead of prepping myself and taking the time, it was like a big blow up to my face. The steps don't put us in the situation of putting us in danger, or making the situation worse. And I will get to another point in a minute it is quoted in here we think we prepare we think we prepare we plan and become willing and then when it seems all is in place that's when we move into action we are preparing ourselves in making direct amends to those we may have caused harm do you all remember if you watched the last video I said don't trust anybody who says they are the most humble person in the room and they say that I have humility? That is a big lie, okay? So if they're announcing that publicly, there is something wrong, all right? And this is like to draw in for the example in the book. So here is this point. When we are preparing for step nine, we really need to check our motives. I have talked about that a lot in my videos. I talk about it a lot with other people. As human beings, we really do have to check our motives because sometimes we're like, well, if I do this, what am I going to get out of it? You know, that kind of thing, because it always goes back to me. When I am doing this and I'm making an amends to someone, I am going in with no expectation in return. I have said that before. So if I go in to an amends and I am expecting the person to accept my amends and then we will be good old buddies again and it turns out this person doesn't want to speak to me and wants to have nothing to do with me, I'm going to be a little hurt by what happened and flip to page, you know, 365 on picking your ending, okay? So, do you remember those books? Goosebumps used to do that. So, but I digress. <laughs> when I go in without expectation, I set myself up. And what I was trying to bring up this point of when I am patient, I 
plan and I see how things may play out. It's not setting the expectation of what is going to happen, but how things will play out. It could be either good or bad, but it places me in a state of neutrality where I will be okay and be in acceptance. Acceptance. Acceptance, okay? Y'all know acceptance is the answer. <laughs> I'm gonna cover that in another video, okay? I am placed in a state of neutrality when I get to step nine, I'm making amends to specific people. And whether the outcome be good or bad, I will be okay either way and I can accept it is just what it is. Because if I go into an amends to show the person that I have changed, which is what happens and what I have seen or heard or experienced or give counsel in someone is, Somebody is putting in all this work, okay? Say, say me pertaining to me. Say I am trying to do these steps in hopes of getting my family back or getting my job back or, you know, whatever it is to obtain. That is my motive, okay? To get some sort of outcome from it. And so when I go and make the amends, say if it is for an employer and apologizing, again, I will put that in step nine. There's another point to this, but I'm not going to try to jump the gun. So I go to the employer and I apologize, hoping to get my job back. And they tell me, no, I'm sorry, we cannot. And that is what I'm talking about on the expectations and checking our motives. So... This I've seen a lot show up as far as like family goes, um, where here is where it happens. If I am going into 12 steps or going into recovery or trying to make myself for the better, I lose the big picture. I'm losing the focus on me and trying to help myself and better myself. I am not doing this for other people. I will have to say, when I, partially when I had gotten in the rooms, I was afraid that I was gonna be divorced with my husband because he just had enough of my stuff. So when I went in, I knew I had a problem. I know it needed to be fixed, but also I did know that if I didn't get a fix potentially of what I could lose. And there had been times where I'd gotten resentful and it's like, I'm doing all this work and things should be getting better and here it is and it's not is because I set myself up for that and if I continue to think that I'm gonna get some sort of reward for doing things then that's not beneficial and is not beneficial for me and my growth and just accepting things for the way that they are so I think that's a very important thing to understand in step eight is that when we go and make amends to people, it's not to show them how we have changed in hopes that they will meet us halfway or, or getting things back that we may have lost. We are doing this with no expectation in return because that is to, it's for us to find forgiveness in ourselves. It's for us to be one step closer in acceptance of ourselves. And the more that I do this, I am in acceptance of me. And I mentioned that later is that I am in acceptance of you also. We may, when we're preparing ourselves for making an amends, we are preparing ourselves for whatever the outcome or consequences may be. And we are doing this as a selfless act, no matter what the outcome may be. I, I know I have said that I, I do have a couple like side notes. I do have a side note at the end of this video and then there's also a side note that I'm saving for step nine as well. So just bear with me to the end of the video and I'll talk about that. And it's based on experiences in the rooms and um, yeah, I, there's a lot and there's a big E in there and I really wanna address this because it's not addressed in either books. I do believe it is a great reminder that when I am willing to do something, no expectation in return, uh, it's to ensure that I don't get hurt any further um, and kind of putting like these other like grief, shame and other things for the ego, which I mean, I did say sometimes it is good to be like hit with the humility, you know, 
humility stick. <laughs> and But if I'm trying to humble myself, which me going and doing that, if I mentally plan and prepare myself, then that is putting me in a state of neutrality when if it doesn't work out in the best outcome, then I, I knew what to expect either way. But overall in this, this step is to not beat ourselves up. And that's what the point Hebert makes. And this is how we look at everything in a very honest point of view, okay? So we take on the responsibility of our actions and inactions so we can strive to do better and live with integrity and continue to work these steps in our everyday life with other people that we may encounter going forward. If we do something wrong in the future, uh, it, again, maybe it is another, another trait that comes up and has gone awry, then we know how to catch it quicker and we know how to make amends for it faster. So the example in this portion of the book is the butterfly effect, and the breeze and the turbulence of the wings of a butterfly may have a small effect on the local environments. It could have dramatic consequences in the future. The chaos theory suggests that a very small change in initial conditions can have remarkable dynamic effects in the future. So think about it, all these TikTok videos are blowing up and how Moldavite was like the big piece to have and then the kids get the Moldavite and they're all crying, like that was the change of buying the Moldavite. <laughs> I do have Moldavite, there have been some changes for the better, but I mean, not like really, I mean, big like crying changes. I know that they are for the betterment of me, but I mean, everything just where big old tears no like i'm fine i live to tell the tale i'm fine but i tr do truly believe with the point made is that addictions and like alcoholism or even like behaviors that have been ingrained in our brain like that is all like from the number of generations that came before and if you think about it i look at it like this i look at my family and there might have been certain ideas and behaviors, traits that I had growing up that stemmed from the effects of my ancestors that came before me and it goes on to my parents and it goes on to me. And I had to understand that my parents, with the way that I was taught based on the teachings of what they had from their parents, which would be my grandparents and my grandparents, you know, my great grandparents, it keeps going down the line. And if the more that I learn and the more that I know, and the more I'm willing to look at things and be like, well, they had the, they were doing the best that they could or certain things that they learned, they picked up. It doesn't necessarily mean that it was the right thing to do. That is where I had found myself in a state of neutrality and acceptance. And it's like the more that I went back to look, it's like, well, the past is the past. The only thing I can do is change what goes on in the present to ensure what I can do for the future. And really, and whatever else it is that from appearance or what happened from before, I'm willing to see and try to make things better and that's all I can do going forward. I mean look at it too like this. Lois Wilson, she was married to Bill Wilson. This is how al -Anon started. She was affected by Bill and his drinking and the way that they lived their life and so here's Bill like starting these meetings and they're like hosting these alcoholics. I mean they're even opening their home to these alcoholics. That put a toll on her too because she was just going along for the ride because she was trying to be a faithful wife. But it trickled down into her well-being. And so she said, hey, you know what? If the men are meeting in Alcoholics Anonymous, the women can come inside and they can have me for co like come in for coffee and cake or whatever. And we can sit in the kitchen and we can have our own meeting. So that's Al-Anon. <laughs> and a lot of us <laughs> that are alcoholics, we do qualify for Al-Anon or children of, adult children of Alcoholics Anonymous. 
I mean, the branches just keep going on and on and on and on and on. With this step, we learn about integrity, facing our fears, taking ownership and responsibility in our actions and how to plan a sincere apology. We're willing to see how all of this is gonna just play out when we're preparing to make amends. All of us have been acting out of reaction and control when we look back on our lives and what we've done. And yes, control, okay, I, I can attest. I looked at it and this was the point here also is when I tried to control, I thought it was making my life a little more orderly and I thought it, my life was in order until it wasn't, but I really had to look at it and be like, was my life really in order? If I'm trying to control people, places, or things, am I really allowing the next person to me to be who they are, what they are, not trying to find some sort of compromise. And so that's affecting and rippling off into my outside life. Another word that has come up for me today is surrendering. I had to surrender the control and surrendering is the hardest part, the, the hardest thing to do. So as we look at the past and we try to look at future effects of the other person on how our behavior and actions have affected a particular person, we are willing to let go of control and take the ownership and we learn how to avoid prior actions in the future, but we surrender to the what is just is and we plan for the next step to make things right somehow. So this ritual is very visual and what you're going to do is get a very big piece of paper. All right, something that can fit like either in like a plastic tub, your tub or a sink. And you're kind of coming up with something that is like a family tree, but instead uh, this is actually going to be the tree of influence. What instead of going back in time with this tree of influence, you're you're moving outward in your relationships, in your relations and looking at the effects on the outside. So you will write your name in the middle, circle your name. Around your name, you are going to have your family, immediate family, right? All the people that you are with. And then maybe on the outside of that, maybe it's people that you live with, people you work with, different interactions, friends, um, maybe extended family outside. Then you're also kind of looking at say if you did the four step inventory out of the AA big book, the people that you were upset or angry at, okay? And maybe they could have been ex-friends, put them in there. You're also going to get food coloring, she mentions like um, some sort of inks or whatever, but something that you can put in for color and you're gonna put the paper over like maybe an, maybe like an inch, half inch of water and you are going to get the food coloring and put one drop in the center where your name is and see how the color just spans out. Let it disperse and then put another color and see how far reach that it goes. So the whole point of this is seeing once it's been sitting for like an hour, how your actions, either good or ill, is affecting everything on the outside of you of your circle okay so you can look at it as again we weren't trying to get in morbid reflection but the way that i was learning it on the first time was like you know the things that i've done is considered ill how it affected so many people and that brought me to a humbling experience not just getting outside of myself and seeing how it affected other people the other way to look at it is the good that I can do based on the sheet of paper and how the colors disperse out and how the good that I can do can affect the other people on the sheet of paper. Don't overthink it as far as you might have missed somebody. It might happen and that is okay. You're just trying to get the visual ideas and really honing in on the important stuff and really just grasping the whole idea of what I had just stated. When you're done, 
you can choose to keep this paper once it dries out or you can dispose of it in your own ceremonial way like either in fire um, or in ritual put it in a potted plant or something like that so final thoughts before I wrap up okay and I have mentioned this before what I wanted to point out that wasn't addressed in either of the books is when I did my four step there was a sex inventory what I have learned a little more about myself and my behaviors based on that inventory and I haven't had to do a sex inventory since my first one what came up for both just the regular inventory and the sex inventory was I had talked about things that are very horrific for some people um, things that have happened to us that maybe we were too young or maybe I'm going to take my glasses off because <laughs> I'm getting real serious. There might have been things that have happened to us that we really had no control over. Somebody caught us in a very vulnerable state. We weren't trying to put ourselves in danger or again, like I said, we were too young. And those are not addressed in the books at all. And so when we're caught off guard and these situations happen to us, and I am talking about particular events that involve rape, abuse, assault, um, anything else where we have been taken advantage of that we had no absolute, no part, no control over because that does happen. I do want to say, um, yes, the steps have helped me tremendously, but those types of traumas, the 12 steps can't fix it all. And it really isn't the ultimate fix all. It helps, yes, but at that point, when we have some other serious traumas that we are trying to explore, we do need to seek some other outside help from medical professionals that are therapists, psychiatrists, or whatever else uh, finding support groups if we're not able to when we have faced traumatic experiences like that of course we wanted to numb if we tried to some of us when we tried to tell someone whether there was this judgment of these are things we should not talk about or uh, keeping it to yourself and you know people finding that shameful or embarrassing these things happen and you can't gaslight it and pretend like it didn't or gloss over it because they do and this is the opportunity for you if you have faced this before that this is the opportunity for you to honor yourself i want you to honor yourself and know that I tried to numb those feelings too and now it's okay for me to honor myself and speak up, heal myself, get the treatment that I need and know that even though I was defenseless then, I can advocate for myself now and try to get the help that I need for me to recover and try to heal somehow. If you are still angry, I said it in my four year celebration birthday video. If you're feeling angry, it's okay to hold that resentment. I understand. And if you feel sad, it's okay to be sad. Whatever emotion that you feel, you're allowed to feel it because we tried to numb it for so long. What I do know is that if I am trying to honor myself and take the steps necessary to recover from things that happen to me, I have to be willing to seek the outside help. We talked about the 12 steps. Same thing goes for medical professions also. So maybe if it's been ingrained in your brain that there's this judgment of having to go seek therapy or treatment, there's no shame in it. Do it. Do it. Get the help that you need. And what it is, it is for you. It's not for anybody else. This is for 
you, for you to come out to the other side, know and truly understand and honor yourself in the process. When I talked about that list of, of when we're trying to get our list together for step nine, add yourself on that list. That is the most important person because when we're going out and we're extending these amends to people, it could be good or bad. We're trying to find that forgiveness in oneself also. And that is the very big understanding of this. And I have to tell you guys, I've worked on feeling shame for so long. I still feel shame on a, a lot of things. And I do seek outside help. Sometimes rituals do help, but sometimes I do need to get further extended help from a medical professional. Sometimes you do need to take the prescriptions just to help you get through those hard times. And eventually you might not have to take them anymore. There's no shame in that. So if you have to do the things for you, seeking that outside help from medical professionals or support groups or whatever, do it for you. And that is the whole point with this program is the same. It's doing it for you and nobody else. And I think a lot of the times too, when we're in the recovery rooms and people are reading the four step inventory list to us, Sometimes we are not equipped to handle certain things that do come up. Yes, some of us that are in the rooms of recovery, some of us might be doctors, but inclusively, not all of us are doctors, okay? So we can't tell someone, and it says it in the big book, we can't tell someone what to do medically. The only thing we can do is suggest that they go seek outside help. So don't have any of these old timers telling you you need to get rid of your prescriptions or whatever. If you have prescriptions and they are prescribed to you and you take them as prescribed, that is you being honest with you and doing what you need to do instead of abusing what you have been doing. Um, and yeah, that's really all I have to say about that. I was about to get on a tangent and that and get all heated about that because sometimes you do hear that in the rooms and I'm like, uh-uh, we're not playing that. We're not doing that. But the more, so when I talked about the self-forgiveness, the more that I work on myself and work with my shadow, I talk about uh, in other videos on my Witching Out Wednesday videos, I talk about um, work with your light and your shadow because it's both and I have to honor that shadow side of me, get to know it, not to disregard it or take it away, but how to coexist with it and understand more about me and how to integrate and how to work with it, just how to work with it. So when I do all these things and I acknowledge it, I feel so much lighter, I feel lighter. And I don't know about you, but feeling lighter feels so good to me. Feels so good to me. And it has been rough, and I will have to say, I do have a lot of work to still do. I I try to still put these things on here, um, not giving too much away, but also sharing parts in my life that are very real. And... <sighs> because I know I'm not the only one who suffers. And I guess if I put that out there in speaking more so in a upfront type of way and speaking my truth, maybe that kind of gives you something to think about and understand and be like, you know what? I, I can relate and do the things that you are ready to do. Nobody can force you to do anything. And like I said, if you're here, if you're here, I hope you stick around for a while. But if not, I'm okay with that too. So I think that's it for the side notes. <laughs> so if you enjoyed this video, you know the drill. Leave a comment. And I love reading those from y'all. I really, really do. Um, it makes it very interactive. And it 
it does help me sharing my experiences with y'all and if you get anything out of it. Um, if you have any personal questions, I do want to say um, that either regarding like PIR information or maybe some questions you might be afraid to ask, you can email me at GwenTheRecoveringWitch at gmail.com and I will answer. So until next week, I will see you then for step nine and uh, I will have a video out for Witching Out Wednesday, so I'll see you Wednesday, <laughs> but for my full recovery Monday, I will see you next week. So until then, be well.